During the closing decade of the 19th century, elements of old and new existed side by side in China. The years after the Sino-Japanese War saw a reform movement that emphasized the need to use Western learning for practical developments, while Chinese learning was to remain the essence. The Guangxu Emperor was eventually convinced to issue radical reforms, much to the dismay of the arch-conservatives. These arch-conservatives, among whom the Empress Dowager Zixi, immediately started planning ways to obstruct the Emperor, even ways to get rid of him. The Western powers victorious in multiple wars had not just imposed their will on China, but encroached on Chinese territory as well. The impact of foreign imperialism was profound and intensified, the tense atmosphere already present in China due to the self-strengthening movement. Contained mainly to treaty ports with a Western presence, modern influences in China were barely noticeable in the mainland. Even European merchants attempting to move inland had to rely on Chinese middlemen. Foreigners were regarded as exotic the deeper into China one went. Marriages were arranged, girls' feet were still bound, and there was barely any access to formal education. For bright young men, their career path was set in stone, as had been for many centuries. Memorizing Confucian classics, studying hard-to-pass local exams, provincial exams, and eventually the national exam in order to enter the Chinese bureaucratic order. Following the Sino-Japanese War, a new reformist movement sprung up, attempting to reassure the value of Chinese self-strengthening. Chang Chi Tung popularized the slogan Chinese learning for the essential principles, Western learning for practical applications. Holding onto the belief that Chinese traditionalist moral and philosophical values gave meaning to civilization, this position did allow for the adoption of Western practices and the hiring of Western advisors. Earlier in the 19th century, a group of scholars among whom Wei Yuan began to put their focus of their work on practical, political and economic challenges and problems. This was the so-called statecraft school. During the same time, the new text school of Confucianism emerged. This new text school propagated the notion that the new text versions of the Han classics allowed for state reforms to be instigated. Now, this is extremely important. Generations upon generations of scholars had been indoctrinated by their studies in the all-embracing social theory of Confucianism, which emphasized strict hierarchy and traditional values. As such, it was crucial for a change to be sanctioned by these very same ideas. Adopting Western weaponry during the Opium Wars and Western ideas to reform the administration had to be justified by old texts. And as such, basing his works on Confucius, Kung started writing a far-reaching program of modernization for China. His goal was to model China after a constitutional monarchy based on Japanese and European examples. After the Sino-Japanese War, the opportunity Kang had been waiting for presented itself, or so it seemed, the disastrous defeat of China against a smaller Japan and the encroachment of Western powers right after led to an extreme Chinese response. Already in 1895, there were protests in Beijing during the national exam. Over 1,300 exam candidates signed a petition led by no other than Kang Yue and another scholar, Li Qi Chao, that had requested the Qing not accept the peace demands of the peace treaty. As for the rest of China, in many areas, secret societies sprung up in which its members debated about how to reform China. In combination, for the first time, journals and newspapers were circulated outside treaty ports, introducing many Chinese to political commentary. While these developments were suppressed in some areas, in Hunan and Hubei provinces, they were welcomed. Reforms and modernization were pushed by its governor-general, none other than Chang Chi Tung. Chang pressed for the development of a railway line from Hankou to Beijing and built up coal and iron mines. He modernized the capital, streets were paved, street lights were built telegraph lines constructed, and modern curricula in school was instated. Yet, Chang was on good terms with the arch-conservatives, most notably the Empress Dowager Zixi, as he too was convinced of the need of the traditional Confucian ethical system. Zixi was on semi-retirement in her new bold summer palace, and the reform memorial by Kang finally reached the emperor. Kang and Liang were overjoyed when Kang was invited for an imperial audience. 
The first imperial audience lasted for five hours. It is the longest official audience in the history, at least of which the written record survives. During it, Kang was not only full of proposals, but also remarked that if the emperor were to rely on the conservatives for reform, it would be like climbing a tree to seek for fish. In 1898, Kang Yue, together with his younger accomplices Liang Qichao and Tan Su Tung, received the support of the 27-year-old Guangxu Emperor. Between June and September that year, China was flooded with reform edicts, which would change China drastically in virtually every aspect. The government institutions, the traditional exam system, the army, everything would be modernized. The emperor wanted to reduce the importance of traditional poetry in exams, transform old academies to modern schools, and abolish the eight-legged essay altogether. To many, this was about time. He furthermore addressed the need to strengthen China's armed forces. Its navy was destroyed after the Sino-Japanese War, and the funds allocated to the rebuilding of the navy went into the construction of the Summer Palace of Suchi. Yeah, really. Kang proposed that the traditional internal administration with safeguards against enemies from within was useless against the current Western enemies from outside. In his opinion, a cabinet type of domestic administration had to replace the traditional six ministries and grand council. Observing the Japanese example, he noted a parliament was more efficient at raising taxes and checking corruption. Kang Yue was appointed as secretary in the Zhongli Liamen, the government body in charge of foreign policy. European diplomats eagerly welcomed these reforms, but it goes without saying that these modern reforms spark much resistance from the conservatives and traditionalists, not to mention those that simply were bound to profit from the old Chinese order. Now, conservative opposition was loud and strong, and one of the several reasons was the fact that all reformers were Chinese, except for the emperor, who was of course a Manchu. Now, that Chinese reformers were influencing imperial policy, incumbent Manchus feared for their position. Those that held a degree from the traditional examination system feared educational reform would threaten their qualifications. The war on organized corruption threatened, well, nearly everyone that held office. In short, the young emperor was waging a war on the entire Chinese establishment and quickly found himself cornered from all sides radical reformers had the most influence in court. But that would change very soon. Distressed and quietly observing the reforms at first, Empress Dowager Zixi saw her entire power base threatened by the attack on her two pillars of power, organized corruption and classical learning. She started to plot the course of action with several arch conservatives. On the 21st of September 1898, palace guards and eunuchs entered Emperor Guangxu's palace in the Forbidden City and seized all documents pertaining to reforms. Zhu Xi returned to the Forbidden City as well and issued an edict two days later, stating the emperor had fallen ill. It was only right for her to assume regency and, as such, rule over China once again. How convenient. The emperor would remain under house arrest, virtually powerless until he died under mysterious circumstances in 1908. Suspiciously, just one day, before the Empress Dowager herself passed away. At any rate, Cixi was in power, and there was hell to pay for all those that were in favor of reforms. Six intellectuals, the so-called Six Gentlemen of Wushu, were arrested and executed, including Kang's younger brother and the famous philosopher, Tan Sitong. Kang and Liang managed to escape to Japan. The length of the intensive reforms of the emperor would only just pass 100 days. A revolution from above had filled, in contrast to the Meiji Restoration in Japan decades earlier. It suggested that the revolutionary change had to come from below. For now, the dreams for a reform program ended in disaster. As a result of the radical 100 days of reform, a reactionary period of less than three years by the conservatives led by Zixi now followed. They even considered ejecting Westerners with brutal force. It just so happened to be that in northern China, anti-Christian and anti-Western sentiments led to a violent climax. A group that was distantly related to the secret White Lotus Society sparked a rebellion that would once again dramatically change the course of China's history. This group was called the Fists of Harmony and Justice, more commonly known as the Boxers. Next week, we'll look at the unlikely alliance between this group of rebels and Empress Dowager Zixi in a desperate attempt to regain control over China. 
Thank you for watching this video. And if you're interested in the entire story of the downfall of the Qing Dynasty, consider checking out the playlist on the screen right now. If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing to my channel. See you next time.